Chapter Eight of the Metropolis by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The horse show was held in Madison Square Garden, a building occupying a whole city block. It seemed to Montague that during the four days he attended, he was introduced to enough people to fill it to the doors. Each one of the exquisite ladies and gentlemen extended to him a delicately gloved hand, and remarked what perfect weather they were having, and asked him how long he had been in New York, and what he thought of it. Then they would talk about the horses, and about the people who were present, and what they had on. He saw little of his brother, who was squiring the Walling ladies most of the time, and Alice, too, was generally separated from him and taken care of by others. Yet he was never alone. There was always some young matron ready to lead him to her carriage and whisk him away to lunch or dinner. Many times he wondered why people should be so kind to him, a stranger, and one who could do nothing for them in return. Mrs. Billy Alden undertook to explain it to him one afternoon, as he sat in her box. There had to be some people to enjoy, it appeared, or there would be no fun in the game. Everything is new and strange to you, said she, and you're delicious and refreshing. You make these women think, perhaps, they oughtn't to be so bored after all. Here's a woman who's bought a great painting. She's told that it's great, but she doesn't understand it herself. All she knows is that it cost her a hundred thousand dollars. And now you come along and to you it's really a painting. And don't you see how gratifying that is to her? Oliver is always telling me it's bad form to admire, said the man, laughing. Yes, said the other. Well, don't let that brother of yours spoil you. There are more than enough blasé people in town. You be yourself. He appreciated the compliment, but added, I'm afraid that when the novelty is worn off, people will be tired of me. You'll find your place, said Mrs. Alden, the people you like and who like you. And she went on to explain that here he was being passed about among a number of very different sets, with different people and different tastes. Society had become split up in that manner of late, each set being jealous and contemptuous of all the other sets, because of the fact that they overlapped a little at the edges it was possible for him to meet here a great many people who never met each other, and were even unaware of each other's existence. Mrs. Alden went on to set forth the difference between these sets. They ran from the most exclusive down to the most yellow, where they shaded off into disreputable rich, of whom, it seemed, there were hordes in the city. These included sporting and theatrical and political people, some of whom were very rich indeed, and these sets in turn shaded off into the criminals and the devimond, who might also easily be rich. Some day, said Mrs. Alden, you should get my brother to tell you about all these people. He's been in politics, you know, and he has a racing stable. And Mrs. Alden told him about the subtle differences in the conventions of these various sets of society. There was the matter of women smoking, for instance. All women smoked nowadays, but some would do it only in their own apartments, with their women friends, and some would retire to an out-of-the-way corner to do it, while others would smoke in their own dining rooms, or wherever the men smoked. All agreed, however, in never smoking in public, that is, where they would be seen by people not of their own set. Such, at any rate, had always been the rule, though a few daring ones were beginning to defy even that. Such rules were very rigid, but they were purely conventional. They had nothing to do with right or wrong, a fact which Mrs. Alden set forth with her usual incisiveness. A woman, married or unmarried, might travel with a man all over Europe, and everyone might know that she did it, but it would make no difference, 
so long as she did not do it in America. There was one young matron whom Montague would meet, a raging beauty who regularly got drunk at dinner parties and had to be escorted to her carriage by the butler. She moved in the most exclusive circles, and everyone treated it as a joke. Unpleasant things like this did not hurt a person unless they got out, that is, unless they became a scandal in the courts or the newspapers. Mrs. Alden herself had a cousin, whom she cordially hated, who had gotten a divorce from her husband and married her lover forthwith, and had for this been ostracized by society. Once when she came to some semi-public affair, fifty women had risen at once and left the room. She might have lived with her lover, both before and after the divorce, and everyone might have known it, and no one would have cared. But the Covenances declared that she should not marry him until a year had elapsed after the divorce. One thing to which Mrs. Alden could testify, as a result of a lifetime's observation, was the rapid rate at which these conventions, even the most essential of them, were giving way and being replaced by a general do-as-you-please. Anyone could see that the power of women like Mrs. Devon, who represented the old regime and were dignified and austere and exclusive, was yielding before the onslaught of new people, who were bizarre and fantastic and promiscuous and loud. And the younger sets cared no more about anyone nor about anything under heaven, save to have a good time in their own harem-scarum ways. In the old days, one always received a neatly written or engraved invitation to dinner, worded in impersonal and formal style. But the other day, Mrs. Alden had found a message which had been taken from the telephone. Please come to dinner, but don't come unless you can bring a man or will be thirteen at the table and along with this went a perfectly incredible increase in luxury and extravagance. "'You are surprised at what you see here today,' said she. "'But take my word for it. If you were to come back five years later, you'd find all our present standards antiquated, and our present pacemakers sent to the rear. You'd find new hotels and theaters opening, and food and clothing, and furniture that cost twice as much as they cost now.' Not so long ago, a private car was a luxury. Now, it's as much a necessity as an opera box or a private ballroom. And people who really count have private trains. I remember when our girls wore pretty Muslim gowns in summer and sent them to wash. Now they wear what they call lingerie gowns, dimity and princess, with silk embroidery and real lace and ribbons. That cost a thousand dollars a piece and won't wash. Years ago, when I gave a dinner, I invited a dozen friends, and my own chef cooked it and my own servants served it. Now I have to pay my steward ten thousand a year, and nothing that I have is good enough. I have to ask forty or fifty people, and I call in a caterer, and he brings everything of his own, and my servants go off and get drunk. You used to get a good dinner for ten dollars a plate, and fifteen was something special. But now you hear of dinners that cost a thousand a plate, and it's not enough to have beautiful flowers on the table. You have to have scenery. There must be rural landscape for a background, and goldfish in the finger bowls, and five thousand dollars worth of Florida orchids on the table, and floral favors of roses that cost a hundred and fifty dollars a dozen. I attended a dinner at the Waldorf last year that cost $50,000, and when I asked those people to see me, I have to give them as good as I got. The other day, I paid $1,000 for a tablecloth. Why do you do it? asked Montague abruptly. God knows, says the other. I don't. I sometimes wonder myself. I guess it's because I've nothing else to do. It's like the story they tell about my brother. He was losing money in a gambling place in Saratoga, and someone said to him, Davy, why do you go there? Don't you know the game is crooked? Of course it's crooked, said he, but damn it, it's the only game in town. 
"'The pressure is more than anyone can stand,' said Mrs. Alden, after a moment's thought. "'It's like trying to swim against a current. You have to float and do what everyone expects you to do. Your children and your friends and your servants and your tradespeople. All the world is in a conspiracy against you.' "'It's appalling to me,' said the man. "'Yes,' said the other, "'and there's never any end to it. You think you know it all, but you find you really know very little. Just think of the number of people there are trying to go the pace. They say there are seven thousand millionaires in this country. But I say there are twenty thousand in New York alone. Or if they don't own a million, they are spending the income of it, which amounts to the same thing. You can figure that a man who pays ten thousand a year for rent is paying fifty thousand to live. And there's Fifth Avenue, two miles of it, if you count the uptown and downtown parts. And there's Madison Avenue, and a half a dozen houses adjoining on every side street. And then there are the hotels and apartment houses, to say nothing of the West Side and Riverside Drive. And you meet these mobs of people in the shops and the hotels and the theaters, and they all want to be better dressed than you. I saw a woman here today that I never saw in my life before. And I heard her say she'd paid two thousand dollars for a lace handkerchief. And it might have been true, for I've been asked to pay ten thousand for a lace shawl at a bargain. It's a common enough thing to see a woman walking on Fifth Avenue with twenty or thirty thousand dollars worth of furs on her. Fifty thousand is often paid for a coat of sable. And I know of one that costs two hundred thousand. I know women who have a dozen sets of furs, ermine, chinchilla, black fox, baby lamb, mink, and sable. And I know a man whose chauffeur quit him because he wouldn't buy him a ten-thousand-dollar fur coat. And once people used to pack their furs away and take care of them. But now they wear them about the street or at the seashore, and you can fairly see them fade or else their cut goes out of fashion, and so they have to have new ones. All this was material for thought. It was all true. There was no question about that. It seemed to be the rule that whenever you questioned a tale of extravagance of New York, you would hear the next day of something several times more startling. Montague was staggered at the idea of a $200,000 fur coat and yet not long afterwards there arrived in the city a titled Englishwoman, who owned a coat worth a million dollars, which hard-headed insurance companies had insured for half a million. It was made of the soft plumage of rare Hawaiian birds, and had taken twenty years to make. Each feather was crescent-shaped, and there were wonderful designs in crimson and gold and black. Every day in the casual conversation of your acquaintances you heard of similar incredible things. A tiny, antique Persian rug, which could be folded into an overcoat pocket for ten thousand dollars. A set of five art fans, each blade painted by a famous artist and costing forty-three thousand dollars. A crystal cup for eighty thousand, and an edition deluxe of the works of Dickens for a hundred thousand. A ruby the size of a pigeon's egg, for three hundred thousand. In some of these great New York palaces there were fountains which cost a hundred dollars a minute to run, and in the harbor there were yachts which cost twenty thousand a month to keep in commission. And that same day, as it chanced, he learned of a brand new kind of squandering. He went home to lunch with Mrs. Winnie Duval, and there he met Miss Caroline Smith with whom he had talked at Castle Havens. Mrs. Smith, whose husband had been a well-known Wall Street plunger, was soft and mushy and very gushing in her manner, and she asked him to come home to dinner with her, adding, I'll introduce you to my babies. From what Montague had so far seen, he judged that babies played a very small part in the lives of the women of society, and so he was interested and asked, How many have you? Only two in town, said Mrs. Smith. I've just come up, you see. How old are they? he inquired politely, when the lady added. About two years. 
he asked won't they be in bed by dinner time oh my no said mrs smith the dear little lambs wait up for me i always find them scratching at my chamber door and wagging their little tails then mrs winnie laughed merrily and said why do you fool him and went on to inform montague that caroline's babies were griffin's bruxelles griffin suggested to him vague ideas of dragons and unicorns and gargoyles but he said nothing more save to accept the invitation and that evening he discovered that griffin's Brussel were tiny dogs long-haired yellow and fluffy and that for her two priceless treasures mrs smith had an expert nurse to whom she paid a hundred dollars a month and also a footman and a special cuisine in which their complicated food was prepared they had a regular dentist and a physician and a gold plate to eat from mrs smith also owned two long-haired st bernards of a very rare breed and a fierce great dane and a very fat boston bull pup the last having been trained to go for an airing all alone in her carriage with a solemn coachman and footman to drive him montague deftly keeping the conversation upon the subject of pets learned that all this was quite common many women in society artificially made themselves barren because of the inconvenience incidental to pregnancy and motherhood and instead they lavished their affections upon cats and dogs some of these animals had elaborate costumes rivaling in expensiveness those of their stepmothers they wore tiny boots which cost eight dollars a pair house boots and street boots laced up to the knees they had house coats walking coats dusters sweaters coats lined with ermine and automobile coats with head and chest protectors and hoods and goggles and each coat fitted with a pocket for its tiny handkerchief of fine linen or lace and they had collars set with rubies and pearls and diamonds one had a collar that cost ten thousand dollars sometimes there would be a coat to match every gown of the owner there were dog nurseries and resting rooms in which they might be left temporarily and manicure parlors for cats with the physician in charge when these pets died there was an expensive cemetery in brooklyn especially for their internment and they would be duly embalmed and buried in plush lined caskets and would have costly marble monuments when one of mrs smith's best-loved pugs had fallen ill of congestion of the liver she had a tan bark put upon the street in front of her house and when in spite of this the dog died she had sent out cards edged in black inviting her friends to a memorial service also she showed montague a number of books with very costly bindings in which were demonstrated the unity simplicity and immortality of the souls of cats and dogs apparently the sentimental mrs smith was willing to talk about these pets all through dinner and so was her aunt a thin and angular spinster who sat on montague's other side and he was willing to listen he wanted to know it all there were umbrellas for dogs to be fastened over their backs in wet weather there were manicure and toilet sets and silver medicine chests and jewel studded whips there were sets of engraved visiting cards there were wheelchairs in which invalid cats and dogs might be taken for an airing there were shows for cats and dogs with pedigrees and prizes and nearly as great crowds as the horse show mrs smith st bernard's were worth seven thousand dollars apiece and there were bulldogs worth twice that there was a woman who had come all the way from the pacific coast to have a specialist perform an operation upon the throat of her yorkshire terrier there was another who had built for her dog a tiny queen anne cottage with rooms papered and carpeted and hung with lace curtains once a young man of fashion had come to the waldorf and registered himself and miss elsie cochran and when the clerk made the usual inquiries as to the relationship of the young lady it transpired 
that Miss Elsie was a dog, arrayed in a prim little tea gown, and requiring a room to herself. And then there was a tale of a cat, which had inherited a life pension from a $40,000 estate. It had a two-floor apartment and several attendants, and sat at table and ate shrimp and Italian chestnuts, and had a velvet couch for naps and a fur-lined basket for sleeping at night. Four days of horses were enough for Montague, and on Friday morning, when Siegfried Harvey called him up and asked him if he and Alice would come out to the roost for the weekend, he accepted gladly. Charlie Carter was going and volunteered to take them in his car, and so again they crossed the Williamsburg Bridge, the Jewish Passover, as Charlie called it, and went out on Long Island. Montague was very anxious to get a line on Charlie Carter, for he had not been prepared for the startling promptness with which this young man had fallen at Alice's feet. It was so obvious that everybody was smiling over it. He was with her every minute that he could arrange it, and he turned up at every place to which she was invited. Both Mrs. Winnie and Oliver were quite evidently complacent, but Montague was by no means the same. Charlie had struck him as a good-natured but rather weak youth, inclined to melancholy. He was never without a cigarette in his fingers, and there had been signs that he was not quite proof against the pitfalls which society set about him in the shape of decanters and wine cups. Though in a world where the fragrance of spirits was never out of one's nostrils, and where people drank with such perplexing frequency, it was hard to know where to draw a line. "'You won't find my place like the Havens,' Siegfried Harvey had said. "'It is real country.' Montague found it the most attractive of all the homes he had seen so far. It was a big, rambling house, all in rustic style, with great hewn logs outside and rafters within, and a winding oak stairway, and any number of dens and cozy corners and broad window seats with mountains of pillows. Everything here was built for comfort. There was a billiard room and a smoking room, and a real library with readable books and great chairs in which one sank out of sight. There were log fires blazing everywhere, and pictures on the walls that told of sport, and no end of guns and antlers and trophies of all sorts. But you are not to suppose that all this elaborate rusticity would be any excuse for the absence of attendants in livery, and a chef who boasted the cordon bleu, and a dinner-table resplendent with crystal and silver and orchids and ferns. After all, though the host had called it a small place, he had invited twenty guests, and he had a hunter in his stables for each one of them. But the most wonderful thing about the roost was the fact that, at the touch of a button, all the walls of the lower rooms vanished into the second story, and there was one huge, log-lighted room with violins tuning up and calling to one's feet. They set a fast pace here. The dancing lasted until three o'clock, and at dawn again they were dressed and mounted and following the pink-coated grooms and the hounds across the frost-covered fields. Montague was half prepared for a tame fox, but this was spared him. There was a real game, it seemed, and soon the pack gave tongue and away went the hunt. It was the wildest ride that Montague had ever taken, over ditches and streams and innumerable rail fences, and through thick coverts and densely populated barnyards. But he was in at the death, and Alice was only a few yards behind, to the immense delight of the company. This seemed to Montague the first real life he had met, and he thought to himself that these full-blooded and high-spirited men and women made a set into which he would have been glad to fit, save only that he had to earn his living, and they did not. In the afternoon there was more riding and walks in the crisp November air, and indoors bridge and rackets and ping-pong, and a fast and furious game of roulette with the host as banker. "'Do I look much like a professional gambler?' he asked Montague. And when the other replied that he had not yet met any New York gamblers, 
Young Harvey went on to tell how he had gone to buy this apparatus, the sale of which was forbidden by law, and had been asked by the dealer how strong he wanted it. Then in the evening there was more dancing, and on Sunday another hunt. That night a gambling mood seemed to seize the company. There were two bridge tables, and in another room, the most reckless game of poker that Montague had ever sat in. It broke up at three in the morning, and one of the company wrote him a check for sixty-five hundred dollars. But even that could not entirely smooth his conscience, nor reconcile him to the fever that was in his blood. Most important to him, however, was the fact that during the game he at last got to know Charlie Carter. Charlie did not play for the reason that he was drunk, and one of the company told him so and refused to play with him which left poor Charlie nothing to do but get drunker. This he did, and came and hung over the shoulders of the players, and told the company all about himself. Montague was prepared to allow for the wild oats of a youngster, with unlimited money, but never in his life had he heard or dreamed of anything like this boy. For half an hour he wandered about the table, and poured out a steady stream of obscenities his mind was like a swamp, in which dwelt loathsome and hideous serpents, which came to the surface at night and showed their flat heads and their slimy coils. In the heavens above, or the earth beneath, there was nothing sacred to him. There was nothing too revolting to be spewed out. And the company accepted the performance as an old story. The men would laugh and push the boy away and say, Oh, Charlie, go to the devil. After it was all over, Montague took one of the company aside and asked him what it meant, to which the man replied, Good God, do you mean that nobody has told you about Charlie Carter? It appeared that Charlie was one of the gilded youths of the Tenderloin, whose exploits had been celebrated in the papers. And after the attendants had bundled him off the bed, several of the men gathered about the fire and sipped hot punch, and rehearsed for Montague's benefit some of his leading exploits. Charlie was only twenty-three, it seemed, and when he was ten his father had died and left him eight or ten millions in trust for him. In the care of a poor, foolish aunt, whom he twisted about his finger, at the age of twelve he was a cigarette fiend and had the run of the wine cellar. When he went to a rich private school, he took whole trunks full of cigarettes with him, and finally ran away to Europe to acquire the learnings of the brothels of Paris. And then he came home and struck the tenderloin. And at three o'clock one morning he walked through a plate-glass window, and so the newspapers took him up. That had suddenly opened a new vista in life for Charlie. He became a devotee of fame. Everywhere he went he was followed by newspaper reporters, and a staring crowd. He carried wads as big round as his arm, and gave away hundred-dollar tips to boot blacks, and lost forty thousand dollars in a game of poker. He gave a feat for the demimon, with a jeweled Christmas tree in midsummer, and fifty thousand dollars worth of splendor. But the greatest stroke of all was the announcement that he was going to build a submarine yacht and fill it with chorus girls. Now Charlie had sunk out of public attention, and his friends would not see him for days. He would be lying in a sporting house, literally wallowing in champagne. And all this, Montague realized, his brother must have known. And he had said not a word about it, because of the eight or ten millions which Charlie would have when he was twenty-five. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of the Metropolis by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the morning they went home with others of the party by train. They could not wait for Charlie and his automobile, because Monday was the opening night of the opera, and no one could miss that. Here society would appear in its most gorgeous raiment, and there would be a show of jewelry 
such as could be seen nowhere else in the world. General Prentice and his wife had opened their townhouse and had invited them to dinner and to share their box, and so at about half-past nine Montague found himself seated in a great balcony of the shape of a horseshoe, with several hundred of the richest people in the city. There was another tier of boxes above, and three galleries above that, and a thousand or more people seated and standing below him. Upon the big stage there was an elaborate and showy play, the words of which were sung to the accompaniment of an orchestra. Now Montague had never heard an opera, and he was fond of music. The second act had just begun when he came in, and all through it he sat quite spellbound, listening to the most ravishing strains that ever he had heard in his life. He scarcely noticed that Mrs. Prentice was spending her time studying the occupants of other boxes through a jeweled lorgnette, or that Oliver was chattering to her daughter. But after the act was over, Oliver got him alone outside the box and whispered, "'For God's sakes, Alan, don't make a fool of yourself.' "'Why, what's the matter?' asked the other. "'What will people think?' exclaimed Oliver, "'seeing you sitting there like a man in a dope dream.' "'Why?' laughed the other. "'They'll think I'm listening to the music.' To which Oliver responded, "'People don't come to the opera to listen to the music.' This sounded like a joke, but it was not. To society, the opera was a great state function, an exhibition of far more exclusiveness and magnificence than the horse show, and society certainly had the right to say, for it owned the opera house and ran it. The real music lovers who came either stood up in the back or sat in the fifth gallery close to the ceiling, where the air was foul and hot. How much society cared about the play was sufficiently indicated by the fact that all of the operas were sung in foreign languages, and sung so carelessly that the few who understood the language could make but little of the words. Once there was a world poet who devoted his life to trying to make the opera an art, and in the battle with society he all but starved to death. Now, after half a century, his genius had triumphed, and society consented to sit for hours in darkness and listen to the domestic disputes of German gods and goddesses. But what society really cared for was a play with beautiful costumes and scenery and dancing, and pretty songs to which one could listen while one talked. The story must be elemental and passionate, so that one could understand it in pantomime say the tragic love of a beautiful and noble-minded courtesan for a gallant young man of fashion. Nearly everyone who came to the opera had a glass, by means of which they could bring each gorgeously clad society dame close to him and study her at leisure. There were said to be two hundred million dollars worth of diamonds in New York, and those that were not in the stores were very apt to be at this show for here was where they could accomplish the purpose for which they existed. Here was where all the world came to stare at them. There were nine prominent society women, whom among them displayed five million dollars worth of jewels. You would see stomachers which looked like a piece of coat of mail, and they were made wholly of blazing diamonds. You would see emeralds and rubies and diamonds and pearls, made in tiaras, that is to say, imitation crowns and coronets, and exhibited with a stout and solemn dowager for a pediment. One of the Wallings had set this fashion, and now every one of importance wore them. One lady, to whom Montague was introduced, made a specialty of pearls. Two black pearl earrings at forty thousand dollars, a string at three hundred thousand, a brooch of pink pearls at fifty thousand, and two necklaces at a quarter of a million each. This incessant repetition of the prices of things came to seem very sordid, but Montague found that there was no getting away from it. 
the people in society who paid these prices affected to be above all such considerations to be interested only in the beauty and artistic excellence of the things themselves but one found that they always talked about the prices which other people had paid and that somehow other people always knew what they had paid they took care also to see that the public and the newspapers knew what they had paid and knew everything else that they were doing at this opera for instance there was a diagram of the boxes printed upon the program and a list of all the box holders so that anyone could tell who was who you might see these great dames in their gorgeous robes coming from their carriages with crowds staring at them and detectives hovering about and the bosom of each would be throbbing with a wild and wonderful vision of the moment when she would enter her box and the music would be forgotten and all eyes would be turned upon her and she would lay aside her wraps and flash upon the staring throngs a vision of dazzling splendor some of these jewels were family treasures well known to new york for generations and in such cases it was becoming the fashion to leave the real jewels in the safe deposit vault and to wear imitation stones exactly like them from homes where the jewels were kept detectives were never absent and in many cases there were detectives watching the detectives and yet every once in a while the newspapers would be full of a sensational story of a robbery then the unfortunates who chanced to be suspected would be seized by the police and subjected to what was jocularly termed the third degree and consisted of tortures as elaborate and cruel as any which the spanish inquisition had invented the advertising value of this kind of thing was found to be so great that famous actresses also had costly jewels and now and then would have them stolen that night when they had got home montague had a talk with his cousin about charlie carter he discovered a peculiar situation it seemed that alice already knew that charlie had been bad he was sick and miserable and her beauty and innocence had touched him and made him ashamed of himself and he had hinted darkly at dreadful evils thus carefully veiled and tinged with mystery and romance montague could understand how charlie made an interesting and appealing figure he says i'm different from any girl he ever met said alice a remark of such striking originality that her cousin could not keep back his smile alice was not the least bit in love with him and had no idea of being and she said that she would accept no invitations and never go alone with him but she did not see how she could avoid him when she met him at other people's houses and to this montague had to assent general prentice had inquired kindly as to what montague had seen in new york and how he was getting along he added that he had talked about him to judge ellis and that when he was ready to get to work the judge would perhaps have some suggestions to make to him he approved however of montague's plan of getting his bearings first and said that he would introduce him and put him up at a couple of the leading clubs all this remained in montague's mind but there was no use trying to think of it at the moment thanksgiving was at hand and in countless country mansions there would be gaieties under way bertie stuyvesant had planned an excursion to his adirondack camp and had invited a score or so of young people including the montagues this would be a new feature of the city's life worth knowing about their expedition began with a theater party bertie had engaged four boxes and they met there an hour or so after the performance had begun this made no difference however for the play was like the opera a number of songs and dances strung together with only plot enough to provide occasion for elaborate scenery and costumes from the play they were carried to the grand central station and a little before midnight bertie's private train set out on its journey 
This train was a completely equipped hotel. There was a baggage compartment and a dining car and kitchen, and a drawing room and library car, and a bedroom car, not with berths, such as the ordinary sleeping car provides, but with comfortable bedrooms, furnished in white mahogany, and provided with running water and electric light. All these cars were built of steel and automatically ventilated, and they were furnished in the luxurious fashion of everything with which Bertie Stuyvesant had anything to do. In the library car there were velvet carpets upon the floor, and furniture of South American mahogany, and paintings upon the walls, over which great artists had labored for years. Bertie's chef and servants were on board, and a supper was ready in the dining car, which they ate while watching the Hudson by moonlight. And the next morning they reached their destination, a little station in the mountain wilderness. The train lay upon a switch, and so they had breakfast at their leisure, and then, bundled in furs, came out into the crisp, pine-laden air of the woods. There was snow upon the ground, and eight big sleighs waiting. For nearly three hours they drove in the frosty sunlight, through most beautiful mountain scenery. A good part of the drive was in Bertie's preserve, and the road was private, as big signs notified one every hundred yards or so. So at last they reached the lake, winding like a snake among towering hills, with a huge baronial castle standing out upon the rocky shore. This imitation fortress was the camp. Bertie's father had built it, and visited only half a dozen times in his life. Bertie himself had only been here twice, he said. The deer were so plentiful that in the winter they died in scores. Nevertheless, there were thirty gamekeepers to guard the ten thousand acres of forest, and prevent anyone's hunting in it. There were many such preserves in the Adirondack wilderness, so Montague was told. One man had a whole mountain fenced about with heavy iron railing, and had moose and elk and even wild boar inside. As for the camps, there were so many that a new style of architecture had been developed here. To say nothing of those which followed old styles, like this imported Rhine castle. One of Bertie's crowd had a big Swiss chalet, and one of the Wallings had a Japanese palace, to which he came every August, a house which had been built from plans drawn in Japan, and by laborers imported especially from Japan. It was full of Japanese ware, furniture, tapestry, and mosaics, and the guides remembered, with wonder, the strange, silent, brown-skinned little men who had labored for days at carving a bit of wood, and had built a tiny pagoda-like tea-house, with more bits of wood in it than a man could count in a week. They had a luncheon of fresh venison and partridge and trout, and in the afternoon a hunt. The more active set out to track the deer in the snow, but most prepared to watch the lake shore, while the gamekeepers turned loose the dogs back in the hills. This hounding was against the law, but Bertie was his own law here, and at the worst there could simply be a small fine imposed upon some of the keepers. They drove eight or ten deer to water, and as they fired as many as twenty shots at one deer, they had quite a lively time. Then at dusk they came back into a fine glow of excitement, and spent the evening before the blazing logs, telling over their adventures. The party spent two days and a half here, and on the last evening, which was Thanksgiving, they had a wild turkey which Bertie had shot the week before in Virginia, and were entertained by a minstrel show which had been brought up from New York the night before. The next afternoon they drove back to the train. In the morning, when they reached the city, Alice found a note from Mrs. Winnie Duval, begging her and Montague to come to lunch and attend a private lecture by the Swami Babu Banana, who would tell them all about the previous states of their souls. They went, though not without a protest 
from old Mrs. Montague, who declared it was worse than Bob Ingersoll. And then, in the evening, came Mrs. de Graffenreed's opening entertainment, which was one of the great events of the social year. In the general rush of things, Montague had not had a chance properly to realize it, but Reggie Mann and Mrs. de Graffenreed had been working over it for weeks. When the Montagues arrived, they found the Riverside Mansion, which was decorated in imitation of an Arabian palace, turned into a jungle of tropical plants. They had come early at Reggie's request, and he introduced them to Mrs. de Graffenreed, a tall and angular lady with a leathern complexion painfully painted. Mrs. de Graffenreed was about fifty years of age, but like all women of society, she was made up for thirty. Just at present, there were beads of perspiration upon her forehead. Something had gone wrong at the last moment, and so Reggie would have no time to show them the favors as he had intended. About a hundred and fifty guests were invited to this entertainment. A supper was served at little tables in the great ballroom, and afterward the guests wandered about the house while the tables were whisked out of the way and the room turned into a playhouse. A company from one of the Broadway theaters would be bundled into cabs at the end of the performance, and by midnight they would be ready to repeat the performance at Mrs. de Graffenreed's. Montague chanced to be near when this company arrived, and he observed that the guests had crowded up too close and not left room enough for the actors. So the manager had placed them in a little anteroom, and when Mrs. de Graffenreed observed this, she rushed at the man and swore at him like a dragoon, and ordered the bewildered performers out into the main room. But this was peering behind the scenes, and he was supposed to be watching the play. The entertainment was another musical comedy, like the one he had seen a few nights before. On that occasion, however, Bertie Stuyvesant's sister had talked to him the whole time, and now he was let alone he had a chance to watch the performance. This was a very popular play. It had had a long run, and the papers told how its author had an income of a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year. And here was an audience of the most rich and influential people in the city, and they laughed and clapped and made it clear that they were enjoying themselves heartily. And what sort of play was it? It was called The Caliph of Kamchatka. It had no shred of a plot. The caliph had seventeen wives, and there was an American drummer who wanted to sell him another. But then you did not need to remember this, for nothing came of it. There was nothing in the play which could be called a character. There was nothing which could be connected with any real emotion ever felt by human beings. Nor could one say that there was any incident, at least nothing happened, because of anything else. Each event was a separate thing, like the spasmodic jerking in the face of an idiot. Of this sort of action, there was any quantity. At an instant's notice, everyone on the stage would fall simultaneously into this condition of idiotic jerking. There was rushing about, shouting, laughing, exclaiming. The stage was in continual uproar of excitement, which was without any reason or meaning. So it was impossible to think of the actors in their parts. One kept thinking of them as human beings. Thinking of the awful tragedy of full-grown men and women being compelled by the pressure of hunger to dress up and paint themselves and come out in public and dance, stamp, leap about, wringing their hands, make faces, and otherwise be lively. The costumes were of two sorts, one fantastic, supposed to represent the East, and the other a kind of reductio ad absurdum, of fashionable garb. The leading man wore a natty outing suit, and strutted with a little cane. His stock and trade was a jaunty air, a kind of perpetual flourish, and a wink that suggested the cunning of a satyr. 
The leading lady changed her costume several times in each act, but it invariably contained the elements of bare arms and bosom and back and a skirt which did not reach her knees, and bright colored silk stockings and slippers with heels two inches high. Upon the least provocation, she would execute a little pirouette, which would reveal the rest of her legs, surrounded by a mass of lace ruffles. It was the nature of the human mind to seek the end of things. If this woman had worn a suit of tights and nothing else, she would have been as uninteresting as an underwear advertisement in a magazine. But this incessant, not quite revealing of herself, exerted a subtle fascination. At frequent intervals the orchestra would start up a jerky little tune, and the two stars would begin to sing in nasal voices some words expressive of passion, and then the man would take the woman about the waist and dance and swing her about and bend her backward and gaze into her eyes, actions all vaguely suggestive of the relationship of sex. At the end of the verse a chorus would come gliding on, clad in any sort of costume which admitted of color and the display of legs. The painted women of this chorus were never still for an instant. If they were not actually dancing, they were wiggling their legs and jerking their bodies from side to side and nodding their heads and in all other possible ways being lively. But it was not the physical indecency of this show that struck Montague so much as its intellectual content. The dialogue of the piece was what is called smart, that is, it was full of a kind of innuendo which implied a secret understanding of evil between the actor and his audience, a sort of countersign which passed between them. After all, it would have been an error to say that there were no ideas in the play. There was one idea upon which all the interest of it was based, and Montague strove to analyze this idea and formulate it to himself. There are certain life principles, one might call them moral axioms, that are the result of the experience of countless ages of the human race, and upon the adherence to which the continuance of the race depends. And here was an audience by whom all these principles were, not questioned, not yet disputed, nor yet denied, but to whom the denial was the axiom, something which it would be too banal to state flatly, but which it was elegant and witty to take for granted. In this audience there were elderly people, and married men and women, and young men and maidens, and a perfect gale of laughter swept through it at a story of a married woman whose lover had left her when he got married. She must have been heartbroken, said the leading lady. She was desperate, said the leading man with a grin. What did she do, asked the lady, go and shoot herself? Worse than that, said the man. She went back to her husband and had a baby. But to complete your understanding of the significance of this play, you must bring yourself to realize that it was not merely a play, but a kind of play. It had a name, a musical comedy, the meaning of which everyone understood. Hundreds of such plays were written and produced, and dramatic critics went to see them and gravely discussed them, and many thousands of people made their living by traveling over the country and playing them. Stately theaters were built for them, and hundreds of thousands of people paid their money every night to see them. And all this, no joke and no nightmare, but a thing that really existed. Men and women were doing these things, actual flesh and blood human beings. Montague wondered, in an awe-stricken sort of way, what kind of human being it could be who had flourished the cane and made the grimaces in that play. Later on, when he came to know the Tenderloin, he met this same actor, and he found that he had begun life as a little Irish mick, who lived in a tenement, and whose mother stood at the head of the stairway and defended him with a rolling pin against a policeman who was chasing him. 
he had discovered that he could make a living by his comical antics, and when he came home and told his mother that he had been offered twenty dollars a week by a show manager, she gave him a licking for lying to her. Now he was making three thousand dollars a week, more than the President of the United States and his cabinet, and he was not happy as he confided to Montague, because he did not know how to read, and this was a cause of perpetual humiliation. The secret desire of this little actor's heart was to play Shakespeare. He had had Hamlet read to him, and pondered how to act it. All the time he was flourishing his little cane and making his grimaces. He had chanced to be on the stage when a fire had broken out, and five or six hundred victims of greed were roasted to death. The actor had pleaded with the people to keep their seats, but all in vain. And all his life thereafter he went about with his vision of horror in his mind, and haunted by the passionate conviction that he had failed because of his lack of education. That if only he had been a man of culture, he would have been able to think of something to say to hold those terror-stricken people. At three o'clock in the morning the performance came to an end and then there were more refreshments, and Mrs. Vivie Patton came and sat by him, and they had a nice, comfortable gossip. When Mrs. Vivie once got started at talking about people, her tongue ran on like a windmill. There was Reggie Mann meandering about and simpering at people. Reggie was in his glory at Mrs. de Graffenreid's affairs. Reggie had arranged all this. He did the designing and the ordering and contracted for the shows with the agents. You could bet that he had got his commission on them, too, though sometimes Mrs. de Graffenreid got the shows to come for nothing, because of the advertising her name would bring. Commissions were Reggie's specialty. He had begun life as an auto agent. Montague didn't know what that was. An auto agent was a man who was forever begging his friends to use a certain kind of car so that he might make a living, and Reggie had made about thirty thousand a year in that way. He had come from Boston, where his reputation had been made by the fact that early one morning, as they were driving home from a celebration, he had dared a young society matron to take off her shoes and stockings and get out and wade in the public fountain, and she had done it, and he had followed her. On the strength of this eclat, of this he had been taken up by Mrs. Devon, and one day Mrs. Devon had worn a white gown and asked him what he thought of it. It needs but one thing to make it perfect, said Reggie, and taking a red rose, he pinned it upon her corsage. The effect was magical. Everyone exclaimed with delight, and so Reggie's reputation as an authority upon dress was made forever. Now he was Miss de Graffenreid's right-hand man they made up their pranks together. Once they had walked down the street in Newport with a big rag doll between them, and Reggie had given a dinner at which the guest of honor had been a monkey. Surely Montague had heard of that, for it had been the sensation of the season. It was really the funniest thing imaginable. The monkey wore a suit of broadcloth with collar and cuffs, and he shook hands with all the guests and behaved himself exactly like a gentleman, except that he did not get drunk. And then Mrs. Vivie pointed out the great Mrs. Ridgely Clivingdon, who was sitting with one of her favorites, a grave, black-bearded gentleman, who had leaped into fame by inheriting fifty million dollars. Mrs. R.C. had taken him up and ordered his engagement book for him, and he was solemnly playing the part of a social light. He had purchased an old New York mansion, upon the decoration of which three million dollars had been spent, and when he came down to business from Tuxedo, his private train waited all day for him would steam up. Mrs. Vivie told an amusing tale of a woman who had announced her engagement to him, and borrowed large sums of money upon the strength of it, before his denial came out. That had been a source of great delight to Mrs. de Graffenreid, who was furiously jealous of Mrs. R.C. 
From the antidotes that people told, Montague judged that Mrs. de Graffenreid must be one of those new leaders of society, who, as Mrs. Alden said, were inclined to the bizarre and fantastic. Mrs. de Graffenreid spent half a million dollars every season to hold the position of leader of the Newport set, and you could always count upon her for new and striking ideas. Once she had given away, as a cotillion favor, tiny globes with goldfish in them. Again she had given a dance in which everybody got themselves up as different vegetables. She was fond of going about Newport and inviting people haphazard to lunch, thirty or forty at a time, and then surprising them with a splendid banquet. Again she would give a big formal dinner and perplex people by offering them something which they really cared to eat. You see, exclaimed Mrs. Vivy, at these dinners we generally get thick green turtle soup and omelets with some sort of Florida water poured over them and mushrooms cooked under glass and real handmade desserts. But Mrs. de Graffenreid dared to have baked ham and sweet potatoes or even roast beef. You saw tonight that she had green corn. She must have arranged for that months ahead. We can never get it from Puerto Rico until January. And you see this little dish of wild strawberries? They were probably transplanted and raised in a hothouse, and every single one wrapped separately before they were shipped. All these labors had made Mrs. de Graffing Reed a tremendous power in the social world. She had a savage tongue, said Mrs. Vivie, and everyone lived in terror of her. But once in a while she met her match. Once she had invited a comic opera star to sing for her guests, and all the men had crowded round this actress, and Mrs. de Graffing Reed had flown into a passion and tried to drive them away, and the actress, lolling back in her chair and gazing up idly at Mrs. de Graffing Reed, had drawed, ten years older than God, Poor Mrs. de Graffenreid would carry that saying with her until she died. Something reminiscent of this came under Montague's notice that same evening. About four o'clock, Mrs. Vivie wished to go home, and asked him to find her escort, the Count St. Elmo de Champion, the man, by the way, for whom her husband was gunning. Montague roamed all about the house, and finally went downstairs where a room had been set apart for the theatrical company to partake of refreshments. Mrs. de Graffenreid's secretary was on guard at the door, but some of the boys had gotten into the room, and were drinking champagne and making dates with the chorus girls. And here was Mrs. de Graffenreid herself, pushing them bodily out of the room, a score and more of them, and among them Mrs. Vivie's count. Montague delivered his message and then went upstairs to wait until his own party should be ready to leave. In the smoking room were a number of men also waiting, and among them he noticed Major Venable in conversation with a man whom he did not know. Come over here, the Major called, and Montague obeyed, at the same time noticing the stranger. He was a tall, loose-jointed, powerfully built man a small head and a very striking face, a grim mouth with drooping corners, tightly set and a hawk-like nose and deep-set peering eyes. "'Have you met Mr. Hagen?' said the Major. "'Hagen? This is Mr. Alan Montague. Jim Hagen.' Montague repressed a stare and took the chair which they offered him. "'Have a cigar,' said Hagen, holding out his case. Mr. Montague has just come to New York, said the Major. He is a Southerner, too. Indeed, said Hagen, and inquired what state he came from. Montague replied and added, I had the pleasure of meeting your daughter last week at the horse show. That served to start a conversation, for Hagen came from Texas, and when he found that Montague knew about horses, real horses, he warmed to him. Then the Major's party called him away, and the other two were left to carry on the conversation. It was very easy to chat with Hagen, and yet underneath, 
In the other's mind, there lurked a vague feeling of trepidation, as he realized that he was chatting with a hundred millions of dollars. Montague was new enough at the game to imagine that there ought to be something strange, some atmosphere of awe and mystery about a man who was master of a dozen railroads and the politics of half a dozen states. He was simple and very kindly in his manner, a plain man, interested in plain things. There was about him, as he talked, a trace of timidity, almost of apology, which Montague noticed and wondered at. It was only later, when he had time to think about it, that he realized that Hagen had begun as a farmer's boy in Texas, a poor white, and could it be that after all these years an instinct remained in him, so that whenever he met a gentleman of the Old South, he stood by with a little deference, seeming to beg pardon for his hundred millions of dollars. And yet there was the power of the man. Even chatting about horses, you felt it. You felt that there was a part of him which did not chat, but which sat behind and watched. And the strangest of all, Montague found himself fancying that behind the face that smiled was another face that did not smile, but that was grim and set. It was a strange face, with its broad, sweeping eyebrows and its drooping mouth. It haunted Montague and made him feel ill at ease. There came Laura Hagen, who greeted them in her stately way, and Mrs. Hagen, bustling and vivacious, costumed in grand dame. Come and see me some time, said the man. You won't be apt to meet me otherwise, for I don't go about much. And so they took their departure, and Montague sat alone and smoked and thought. The face still stayed with him, and now suddenly, in a burst of light, it came to him what it was, the face of a bird of prey, of the great wild, lonely eagle. You have seen it, perhaps, in a menagerie, sitting high up, submitting patiently, biding its time, but all the while the soul of the eagle is far away, ranging the wild spaces, ready for the lightning swoop and the clutch with the cruel talons. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of the Metropolis by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The next week was a busy one for the Montagues. The Robbie Wallings had come to town and opened their house, and the time drew near for the wonderful debutante dance at which Alice was to be formally presented to society. And of course, Alice must have a new dress for the occasion and it must be absolutely the most beautiful dress ever known. In an idle moment, her cousin figured out that it would cost her about five dollars a minute to be entertained by the Wallings. What would it cost the Wallings? One scarcely dared to think. Their ballroom would be turned into a flower garden, and there would be a supper for a hundred guests, and still another supper after the dance and costly favors for every figure. The purchasing of these latter had been entrusted to Oliver, and Montague heard with dismay what they were to cost. Robbie couldn't afford to do anything second-rate, was the younger brother's only reply to his exclamations. Alice divided her time between the Wallings and her costumiers, and every evening she came home with a new tale of important developments. Alice was new at the game and could afford to be excited, and Mrs. Robbie liked to see her bright face and to smile indulgently at her eager inquiries. Mrs. Robbie herself had given her orders to her steward and her florist and her secretary and went on her way and thought no more about it. That was the way of the great ladies, or at any rate, it was their pose. The townhouse of the Robbies was a stately palace occupying a block upon Fifth Avenue, one of the half-dozen mansions of the Walling family, which were among the show-places of the city. 
It would take a catalogue to list the establishments maintained by the Wallings. There was an estate in North Carolina, another in the Adirondacks, and others on Long Island and in New Jersey, and there were several in Newport, one of which was almost never occupied, and which Mrs. Billy Alden sarcastically described as a three million dollar castle on a desert. Montague accompanied Alice once or twice, and had an opportunity to study Mrs. Robbie at home. There were thirty-eight servants in her establishment. It was a little state all in itself, with Mrs. Robbie as queen and her housekeeper as prime minister, and under them as many different ranks and classes and castes as in a feudal principality. There had to be six separate dining rooms for the various kinds of servants who scorned each other. There were servants' servants and servants of servants' servants. There were only three to whom the mistress was supposed to give orders, the butler, the steward, and the housekeeper. She did not even know the names of many of them, and they were changed so often that, as she declared, she had to leave it to her detective to distinguish between the employees and burglars. Mrs. Robbie was quite a young woman, but it pleased her to pose as a careworn matron, weary of the responsibilities of her exalted station. The ignorant looked on and pictured her as living in the lap of ease, endowed with every opportunity. In reality, the meanest kitchen maid was freer. She was quite worn thin with the burdens that fell upon her. The huge machine was forever threatening to fall to pieces, and required the wisdom of Solomon and the patience of Job to keep it running. One paid one steward a fortune, and yet he robbed right and left, and quarreled with the chef besides. The butler was suspected of getting drunk upon rare and costly vintages, and the new parlor maid had turned out to be a Sunday reporter in disguise. The man who had come every day for ten years to wind the clocks of the establishment was dead, and the one who took care of the bric-a-brac was sick, and the housekeeper was in a panic over the prospect of having to train another. And even suppose that you escaped from these things, the real problems of your life still had to be faced. It was not enough to keep alive. You had your career, your duties, as leader of society. There was the Daily Mail, with all the pitiful letters from people begging money. Actually, in one single week, there were demands for two million dollars. There were geniuses with patent incubators and stove lifters. And every time you gave a ball, you stirred up swarms of anarchists and cranks. And then there were the letters you really had to answer, and the calls that had to be paid. These latter were so many that people in the same neighborhood had arranged to have the same day at home. Thus, if you lived on Madison Avenue, you had Thursday. But even then, it took a whole afternoon to leave your cards. And then there were invitations to be sent and accepted. And one was always making mistakes and offending somebody. People would become mortal enemies overnight and expect all the world to know it the next morning. And now there were so many divorces and remarryings, with consequent changing of names, and some men knew about their wives' lovers and didn't care, and some did care, but didn't know. Altogether, it was like carrying a dozen chess games in your head. And then there was the hairdresser, and the manicurist, and the masseuse, and the tailor, and the bootmaker, and the jeweler. And then one absolutely had to glance through a newspaper and to see one's children now and then. All this Mrs. Robbie explained at luncheon. It was the rich man's burden, about which common people had no conception whatever. A person with a lot of money was like a barrel of molasses. All the flies in the neighborhood came buzzing about. It was perfectly incredible. The lengths to which people would go to get invited to your house. Not only would they write and beg you, they might attack your business interests and even bribe your friends. And on the other hand, when people thought you needed them, 
the time you had to get them to come. Fancy, said Mrs. Robbie, offering to give a dinner to an English countess and having her try to charge you for coming. And incredible as it might seem, some people actually yielded to her, and the disgusting creature had played the social celebrity for a whole season and made quite a handsome income out of it. There seemed to be no limit to the abjectness of some of the tuft hunters in society. It was instructive to hear Mrs. Robbie denounce such evils, and yet, alas, for human frailty, the next time that Montague called, the great lady was blazing with wrath over the tidings that a new foreign prince was coming to America, and that Miss Ridgely Clevenden had stolen a march upon her and grabbed him. He was to be under her tutelage the entire time, and all the effulgence of his magnificence would be radiated upon that upstart house. Mrs. Robbie revenged herself by saying as many disagreeable things about Mrs. Ridgely Clevington as she could think of, winding up with the declaration that if she behaved with his prince as she had with the Russian Grand Duke, Mrs. Robbie Walling, for one, would cut her dead. And truly, the details which Mrs. Robbie cited were calculated to suggest that her rival's hospitality was a reversion to the customs of primitive savagery. The above is a fair sample of the kind of conversation that one heard when one visited any of the Wallings. Perhaps, as Mrs. Robbie said, it may have been their millions that made necessary their attitude toward other people. Certainly it was, at any rate, that Montague found them all most disagreeable people to know. There was always some tempest in a teapot over the latest machinations of their enemies. And then there was a whole dead mass of people who sponged upon them and toadied to them, and finally the barbarian hordes outside the magic circle of their acquaintance, some specimens of whom came up every day for ridicule. They had big feet and false teeth. They ate mush and molasses. They wore ready-made ties, they said. Do you wish that I should do it? Their grandfathers had been butchers and peddlers and other abhorrent things. Montague tried his best to like the Wallings because of what they were doing for Alice. But after he had sat at their lunch table and listened to a conversation such as this, he found himself in need of fresh air. And then he would begin to wonder about his own relation to these people. If they talked about everyone else behind their backs, certainly they must talk about him behind his. And why did they go out of their way to make him at home? And why were they spending their money to launch Alice in society? In the beginning he had assumed that they did it out of the goodness of their hearts. But now that he had looked into their hearts, he rejected the explanation. It was not their way to shower princely gifts upon strangers in general. The attitude of all the Wallings toward a stranger was that of the London hooligan. Heave a half brick at him. They considered themselves especially appointed by Providence to protect society from the vulgar newly rich, who poured into the city seeking for notoriety and recognition. They prided themselves upon this attitude. They called it their exclusiveness, and the exclusiveness of the younger generation of Wallings had become a kind of insanity. Nor could the reason be that Alice was beautiful and attractive. One could have imagined it if Mrs. Robbie had been like, say, Mrs. Winnie Duval. It was easy to think of Mrs. Winnie taking a fancy to a girl and spending half her fortune upon her. But from a hundred little things that he had seen, Montague had come to realize that the Robbie Wallings, with all their wealth and power and grandeur, were actually quite stingy. While all the world saw them scattering fortunes in their pathway, in reality, they were keeping track of every dollar, and Robbie himself was liable to panic fits of economy, in which he went to the most absurd excesses. Montague once heard him haggling over fifty cents with a cabman. Lavish hosts, though they both were, 
It was the literal truth that they never spent money upon anyone but themselves. And the end and aim of their every action was the power and prestige of the Robbie Wallings. They do it because they are friends of mine, said Oliver, and evidently wished that to satisfy his brother. But it only shifted the problem and set him to watching Robbie and Oliver and trying to make out the basis of their relationship. There was a very grave question concerned in this. Oliver had come to New York comparatively poor, and now he was rich, or at any rate, he lived like a rich man. And his brother, whose scent was growing keener with every day of his stay in New York, had about made up his mind that Oliver got his money from Robbie Walling. Here again the problem would have been simple, if it had been another person than Robbie. Montague would have concluded that his brother was a hanger-on. There were many great families whose establishments were infested with such parasites. Siegfried Harvey, for instance, was a man who had always half a dozen young chaps hanging about him, good-looking and lively fellows who hunted and played bridge and amused the married women while their husbands were at work, and who, if ever they dropped a hint that they were hard up, might be reasonably certain of being offered a check. But if the Robbie Wallings were to write checks, it must be for value received. And what could that value be? Ollie was rather a little god among the ultra-swagger. His taste was a kind of inspiration. And yet his brother noticed that in such questions he always deferred instantly to the Wallings. And surely the Wallings were not people to be persuaded that they needed anyone to guide them in matters of taste. Again, Ollie was the very devil of a wit, and people were heartily afraid of him, and Montague had noticed that he never, by chance, made fun of Robbie. The fetishes of the house of Wallings were always treated with respect. So he had wondered if by any chance Robbie was maintaining his brother in princely state for the sake of his ability to make other people uncomfortable. But he realized that the Robbies, in their own view of it, could have no more need of wit than a battleship has need of pop-guns. Oliver's position, when they were about, was rather that of a man who hardly ever dared to be as clever as he might, because of the restless jealousy of his friend. It was a mystery, and it made the elder brother very uncomfortable. Alice was young and guileless, and a pleasant person to patronize, but he was a man of the world, and it was his business to protect her. He had always paid his own way through life, and he was very loath to put himself under obligations to people like the Wallings, whom he did not like, and who, he felt, instinctively, could not like him. But of course there was nothing he could do about it. The date for the great festivity was set, and the Wallings were affable and friendly, and Alice all a-tremble with excitement. The evening arrived, and with it came the enemy of the Wallings, dressed in their jewels and fine raiment. They had been asked because they were too important to be skipped, and they had come because the Wallings were too powerful to be ignored. They revenged themselves by consuming many courses of elaborate and costly viands, and they shook hands with Alice and beamed upon her, and then discussed her behind her back as if she were a French doll in a showcase. They decided unanimously that her elder cousin was a stick, and that the whole family were interlopers and shameless adventurers, but it was understood that since the Robbie Wallings had seen fit to take them up, it would be necessary to invite them about. At any rate, that was the way it all seemed to Montague, who had been brooding. To Alice it was a splendid festivity, to which exquisite people came to take delight in each other's society. There were gorgeous costumes and sparkling gems. There was a symphony of perfumes intoxicating the senses, and a golden flood of music streaming by. There were laughing voices and admiring glances, and handsome partners with whom one might dance 
through the portals of fairyland. And then, next morning, there were accounts in all the newspapers with descriptions of one's costume, and then some of those present, and even the complete menu of the supper, to assist in preserving the memories of the wonderful occasion. Now they were really in society. A reporter called to get Alice's photo for the Sunday supplement, and floods of invitations came, and with them all the cares and perplexities about which Miss Robbie had told. Some of these invitations had to be declined, and one must know whom it was safe to offend. Also, there was a long letter from a destitute widow, and a proposal from a foreign count. Mrs. Robbie's secretary had a list of many hundreds of these professional beggars and blackmailers. Conspicuous at the dance was Mrs. Winnie, in a glorious electric blue silk gown and she shook her fan at Montague, exclaiming, "'You wretched man! You promised to come and see me.' "'I've been out of town,' Montague protested. "'Well, come to dinner tomorrow night,' said Mrs. Winnie. "'There'll be some bridge fiends.' "'You forgot I haven't learned to play,' he objected. "'Well, come anyhow,' she replied. "'We'll teach you. I'm no player myself, and my husband will be there. And he's good-natured.' and my brother Dan, he'll have to be there, whether he likes it or not. So Montague visited the Snow Palace again, and met Winton Duval, the banker, a tall, military-looking man of about fifty, with a big gray mustache, and bushy eyebrows, and the head of a lion. He was one of the city's biggest banking houses, and in alliance with powerful interests in the street. At present, he was going in for mines in Mexico and South America, and so he was very seldom at home. He was a man of most rigid habits. He would come back unexpectedly after a month's trip and expect to find everything ready for him, both at home and in his office, as if he had just stepped round the corner. Montague observed that he took his menu card and jotted down his comments upon each dish, and then sent it down to the chef. Other people's dinners he very seldom attended, and when his wife gave her entertainments, he invariably dined at the club. He pleaded a business engagement for the evening, and as Brother Dan did not appear, Montague did not learn any bridge. The other four guests settled down to the game, and Montague and Mrs. Winnie sat and chatted basking before the fireplace in the great entrance hall. "'Have you seen Charlie Carter?' was the first question she asked him. "'Not lately,' he answered. "'I met him at Harvey's.' "'I know that,' said she. "'They tell me he got drunk.' "'I'm afraid he did,' said Montague. "'Poor boy!' exclaimed Mrs. Winnie. "'And Alice saw him. He must be heartbroken.' Montague said nothing. You know, she went on, Charlie really means well. He has honestly an affable nature. She paused, and Montague said vaguely, I suppose so. You don't like him, said the other. I can see that. And I suppose now Alice will have no use for him either. And I had it all fixed up for her to reform him. Montague smiled in spite of himself. Oh, I know, said she. It wouldn't have been easy. But you've no idea what a beautiful boy Charlie used to be, until all the women set to work to ruin him. I can imagine it, said Montague, but he did not warm to the subject. You're just like my husband, said Mrs. Winnie sadly. You have no use at all for anything that's weak or unfortunate. There was a pause, and I suppose, she said finally, you'll be turning into a businessman also, with no time for anybody or anything. Have you begun yet? Not yet, he answered. I'm still looking round. I haven't the least idea about business, she confessed. How does one begin at it? I can't say I know that myself as yet, said Montague, laughing. Would you like to be a protégé of my husband's, she asked. The proposition was rather sudden but he answered with a smile. I should have no objections. What would he do with me? I don't know that. 
but he can do whatever he wants downtown, and he'd show you how to make a lot of money if I asked him to. Then Mrs. Winnie added quickly, I mean it. He could do it, really. I haven't the least doubt of it, responded Montague. And what's more, she went on, you don't have to be shy about taking advantage of the opportunities that come to you. You'll find you won't get along in New York unless you go right in and grab what you can. People will be quick enough to take advantage of you. They have all been very kind to me so far, said he, but when I get ready for business, I'll harden my heart. Mrs. Winnie sat lost in meditation. I think business is dreadful, she said. So much hard work and worry. Why can't men learn to get along without it? There are bills that have to be paid, Montague replied. It's our dreadfully extravagant way of life, exclaimed the other. Sometimes I wish I never had any money in my life. You would soon tire of it, said he. You would miss this house. I should not miss it a bit, said Mrs. Winnie promptly. That is really the truth. I don't care for this sort of thing at all. I'd like to live simply and without so many cares and responsibilities. And some day I'm going to do it, too. I really am. I'm going to get myself a little farm, away off somewhere in the country. And I'm going to live there and raise chickens and vegetables and have my own flower gardens that I can take care of myself. It will all be plain and simple. And then Mrs. Winnie stopped short, exclaiming, You are laughing at me. Not at all, said Montague, but I couldn't help thinking about the newspaper reporters. There you are, said she. One can never have a beautiful dream or try to do anything sensible because of the newspaper reporters. If Montague had been meeting Mrs. Winnie Duval for the first time, he would have been impressed by her yearnings for the simple life. He would have thought it an important sign of the times. But alas, he knew by this time that his charming hostess had more flummery about her than anybody else he had encountered, and all of her own devising. Mrs. Winnie smoked her own private brand of cigarettes, and when she offered them to you, there were the arms of the old ducal house of Montmorency on the wrappers. And when you got a letter from Mrs. Winnie, you observed the three-cent stamp upon the envelope for lavender was her color, and two-cent stamps were an atrocious red. So one might feel certain that if Miss Winnie ever went in for chicken raising, the chickens would be especially imported from China or Patagonia, and the chicken coops would be precise replicas of those in the old Chateau de Montmorency, which she had visited in her automobile. But Mrs. Winnie was beautiful and quite entertaining to talk to, so he was respectfully sympathetic while she told him about her pastoral intentions. And then she told him about Mrs. Caroline Smith, who had called a meeting of her friends at one of the big hotels, and organized a society and founded the Bidey Wee Home for Destitute Cats. After that, she switched off into psychic research. Somebody had taken her to a seance, where grave college professors and ladies in spectacles sat round and waited for ghosts to materialize. It was Mrs. Winnie's first experience at this, and she was as excited as a child who had just found the key to the jam closet. I hardly knew whether to laugh or to be afraid, she said. What do you think? You may have the pleasure of giving me my first impressions of it, said Montague, with a laugh. Well, said she, they had table tipping, and it was the most uncanny thing to see the table go jumping about the room. And then there were raps. One can't imagine how strange it was to see people who really believed they were getting messages from ghosts. It positively made my flesh creep. And then this woman... Madam somebody or other went into a trance. Ugh. Afterward, I talked with one of the men, and he told me about how his father had appeared to him in the night and told him he had just been drowned at sea. Have you ever heard of such a thing? We have such a tradition in our family, said he. 
"'Every family seems to have,' said Mrs. Winnie. "'But, dear me, it made me so uncomfortable. "'I lay awake all night expecting to see my father. "'He had the asthma, you know, "'and I kept fancying I heard him breathing. "'They had risen and were strolling into the conservatory, "'and she glanced at the man in armor. "'I got to fancying that his ghost might come to see me,' she said. I don't think I shall attend any more seances. My husband was told that I promised them some money, and he was furious. He's afraid it'll get into the papers. And Montague shook with inward laughter, picturing what a time the aristocratic and stately old banker must have trying to keep his wife out of the papers. Mrs. Winnie turned on the lights in the fountain and sat by the edge, gazing at her fish. Montague was half expecting her to inquire whether he thought they had ghosts, but she spared him this, going off on another line. "'I asked Dr. Perry about it,' she said. "'Have you met him?' Dr. Perry was the rector at St. Cecilia's, the fashionable Fifth Avenue church which most of Montague's acquaintances attended. "'I haven't been in the city over Sunday yet,' he answered, "'but Alice has met him.' "'You must go with me some time,' said she. "'But about the ghosts?' "'What did he say?' "'He seemed to be shy of them,' laughed Mrs. Winnie. "'He said it had a tendency to lead one into dangerous fields. "'But, oh, I forgot. "'I asked my Swami also, and it didn't startle him. "'They are used to ghosts. "'They believe that souls keep coming back to earth, you know. "'I think if it was his ghost, I wouldn't mind seeing it.' for he has such beautiful eyes. He gave me a book of Hindu legends, and there was such a sweet story about a young princess who loved in vain and died of grief, and her soul went into a tigress, and she came in the night time where her lover lay sleeping by the firelight, and she carried him off into the ghost world. It was a most creepy thing. I sat out here and read it and I could imagine the terrible tigress lurking in the shadows, with its stripes shining in the firelight and its green eyes gleaming. You know that poem. We used to read it in school. Tiger, tiger, burning bright. It was not very easy for Montague to imagine a tigress in Mrs. Winnie's conservatory, unless, indeed, one were willing to take the proposition in a metaphorical sense. There are wild creatures which sleep in the heart of man, and which growl now and then, and stir their tawny limbs, and cause one to start and turn cold. Mrs. Winnie wore a dress of filmy softness, trimmed with red flowers, which paled beside her own intense coloring. She had a perfume of her own, with a strange exotic fragrance, which touched the chorus of memory as only an odor can. She leaned towards him, speaking eagerly, with her soft white arms laying upon the basin's rim. So much loveliness could not be gazed at without pain, and a faint trembling passed through Montague, like a breeze across a pool. Perhaps it touched Mrs. Winnie also, for she fell suddenly silent, and her gaze wandered off into the darkness. For a minute or two there was stillness, save for the pulse of the fountain and the heaving of her bosom, keeping time with it. And then in the morning Oliver inquired, Where were you last night? And when his brother answered, at Mrs. Winnie's, he smiled and said, Oh. Then he added gravely, Cultivate Mrs. Winnie. You can't do better at present. End of chapter 10